Welcome to a special episode of the Afikra podcast. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Today we have a conversation with Brendan Kieran Brown, who is an interdisciplinary scholar with degrees in law and a PhD in sociology. He's also the author of Transitional Injustice and Enforcing the Peace on Palestine. Brendan, thanks so much. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, great to be here. So for context, we are recording this on Tuesday, October 24th at 11.30 a.m. in Palestine. And today's conversation, as I told you before, I wanted to talk about justice mm -hmm. and what that word means, um, particularly in, in the dichotomy of maybe another word that is in the title of your book, which is peace, um, and to try and understand that framing. Um, there's a common chant that you hear all over the world, but um, in particular for me, I, I hear it in English and in America all the time, without justice, there can't be peace. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I know what peace means, but I don't know if I know what justice means. And so I told you on the phone beforehand that, that I really wanted to have a conversation with you about what, what that word means in this context and maybe in other contexts as well. So. Maybe the first question I'll ask you is, what do you think your book is about? Transitional injustice and enforcing the peace in Palestine. Just if you can summarize that, the book for our listeners, and then we can use it as a launching point. Yeah, sure. Um, that's a great question. I mean, my book for me was about frustration, I guess. Um, it was about looking at um, the way that I thought a, an industry, a transitional justice industry had popped up or had emerged um, sort of in, in the early 90s and then looking at the way that certain t transitional justice practices um, had been being used or trialed or, or, or yeah, attempted, let's say, in the Palestine context. Um, and I was thinking, like, this just doesn't feel right. You know, there's something, <laughs> there's something not, not so not so great about this. Um, and it was a lot about sort of trying to understand what, <clears throat> what justice means in that, in that context as well, because it, it just feels really elusive. You know, anybody that spent any time in Palestine knows like, there's just, there's hardly any justice for, for anything that's going on. So I guess, um, I guess the book was my attempt at sort of mapping the, the area, what's been going on, on on the ground in terms of various different transitional justice practices, including like truth recovery, how the international international law has been applied or misapplied, let's say, in this context. Yeah, um, yeah and, and can, like trying to understand that a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Can you define that term transitional justice? What does that mean exactly? Yeah, sure. So it's basically um, a set of legal or quasi-legal um, processes that are used in, in, in areas of post-conflict, right? So in spaces where conflicts have come to an end, um, and and you want to try and win the peace, let's say, right? You want to try and embed, um, you want to try and embed a peaceful reality in 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 this post conflict space. So, transitional justice is a is a a term that's been used to sort of capture all the various ways that um, that uh, various states have tried to uh, embed these peace processes. So, um, it, it as I say, look, it involves things like. Um, basically dealing with the past, you know, um, how, how do we, how do we recover the truth of what went on during the conflict? How do we ensure that we reform institutions that were corrupt uh, during a conflict? Uh, how do we ensure that we hold perpetrators responsible, um, you know, in a post-conflict space? So essentially that's yeah. what transitional justice has tried to do, you know, and being from the North of Ireland, um, we, we have our own we have our own complex sort of dealing with the past issues here. Um, and I kind of have been born into that a little bit. You know, ours is a laboratory of transitional justice. So I mm -hmm. guess that's kind of where my interest was sparked a little bit. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. anyone, so many Arabs who care about, um, you know, freedom in Palestine and are very, feel aligned with the solidarity movement are always you know, touched and moved by the amount of solidarity that comes out of, hmm. um, of Northern Ireland. For people who don't know about that history, can you just give a little context and put some meat on the bone as to why there are so many viral clips on social media of people with 
who speak in the accent that you speak in <laughs> talking about um justice in palestine like yeah. give us a little historical context man absolutely it's so inspirational actually um it's it's yeah i'm really proud of it to be honest um i mean we have in ireland um we have our own history of combating you know colonialism fighting against imperialism british imperialism on the island we've we've a long and bloody history of doing that right so um we understand we we're in solidarity because we understand what it means to be forcibly displaced we're in solidarity because we understand what it means you know to have your culture and your heritage erased to have your language rights attacked we understand what it's like um, to, to, you know, to, to be subject to that level of brutal colonial um, violence, right? So, so there's, there's a natural affinity then with other spaces that are going through something similar. Um, and, and, you know, there's a long history of uh, people going from Ireland to Palestine to, to sort of form connections. Um, and that's like just the average person as well. That's not like top down state engagement. That's, um, that's the average grassroots activist. And then former, you know, former combatants in the in the Irish context also met with members of the PLO back in the day in Lebanon. So there was a, you know, building on the energy of the anti-colonial struggles around the world at that time. There was a sense of, you know, trying to form connections. And then of course we have like really strong bonds between the prisoners. You know the Irish prisoner movement, um, uh, the Irish Republican prisoner movement, I should say, and the uh, Palestinian prisoner movement. Um, issues around hunger strike and things like that. So, so the so the connections are really really bond. Now, one thing I would say is at times they can be a little bit complex as well. You know, um, yeah. sometimes you have I think well meaning, well intentioned people going over and trying to promote our own peace building experience into the Palestine context. And when they do that, it, it decontextualizes it, right? It becomes messy. Um, and actually they can end up promoting something that is really problematic. Um, so, but yeah, but for the most part, I mean, I was on the streets in Dublin in, in Ireland's capital city on Saturday. And I honestly, I think there were about 30,000 people there, um, which was huge, yeah. really huge, man, you know, so. It's growing. I would say it's growing, and and you know, with this horrendous moment that we're we're sitting in, um, a lot of people who maybe would have been, let's say, armchair activists, or maybe wouldn't have talked about this openly, now all of a sudden are just saying exactly what they feel in this situation. So, I think that's a yeah. Can you try to explain to me, um, somebody who's not a lawyer, um, this sort of the textbook example of how to achieve justice in this type of environment. Like if I open up the textbook and I look at the graph and it has a little flow chart with dotted lines and next step this and this next step this and then next step this. Hmm. What is the textbook way of achieving justice in a uh, environment that has so much injustice? Um, and yeah. pain and suffering. Well, I just say one thing about the lawyer point. I mean, I I remember within the first week of law school, I decided I would never practice law. That was that wasn't for me. But I certainly find myself in in these spaces. I mean, I guess I'm I'm a big cynic of international law. Um, like there's a whole body of of critical international lawyers. Um, and a whole network of people who who work on a field called like third world approaches to international law who realize that international law is born out of a sort of predatory imperial reality and and you know it can never really provide emancipation or let's use the term justice it can, it's never going to really um apply uh, or or be able to impose some kind of justice framework for people who are especially people who are struggling for anti-colonial liberation you know international law is not going to provide that I guess there's a sense that, you know, certainly in the Palestine context, a lot of energy at this moment in time is going towards, you know, whether or not the International Criminal Court is going to to engage in some way in holding, you know, war criminals and perpetrators of what's going on at this moment in time to account. And, you know, there's this idea that if you bring somebody, if you hold one person 
accountable for this, then there's some kind of justice to be gleaned from that. You know, it's this idea that if you if you bring somebody forward, you you try them, you hold them to account, and it has a trickle down effect almost. Um, but I, I'm really skeptical of that, Mikey. To be honest, in the context of Palestine, when the whole fabric of the space is like so pervasive, it's not just one top down, one you know government, one whatever. It's 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 everywhere. The injustice is industrial scale in Palestine, right? It goes from the settlers in the West Bank. It goes from you know those guys that live within 48 and and are are, are subject to a whole different uh, legal reality to people that are being displaced in Jerusalem, families that are losing their homes. And then that's just not even mentioning what's going on in Gaza right now. So, yeah, so I, I guess I'm not really sure I answered your question very well, but it's, it's, I guess there's this idea that international law can hold one or two despotic people accountable. And then the impact that that has in terms of the trickle down effect, but I'm skeptical, man. Okay. So I think I agree with you more than I, um, I'm, I'm prone to agree with you more about the, the limitations of this traditional international framework, uh, international legal framework and how mm -hmm. it's hard to, how to, it's hard to sort of emancipate yourself from a system if that system itself is, um, is, you know, part of the, um, oppression, um, so what is the what is the solution? What is the answer? I mean, how how has has anyone done this before? Has this ever been successful? I mean, <laughs> have we ever figured this out? Um, I mean, yeah, I get. I mean, yeah, and and we we always got to have hope. You know, that's that's a political act in and of itself is to remain hopeful and to remain yeah. convinced that things change. Nothing lasts forever. At the end of the day, empires fail, empires fall. We've seen that, you know, um, and we have to have hope in that. But I just don't. And, and you know, there there are far far greater legal minds than <laughs> than me in terms sure. of who have used you know and who have shown us how you can pivot international criminal law or you can try and work within the framework of international criminal law. I mean, there's a beautiful book, a brilliant book by uh, Noura Erekat, who's written a book called Justice for Some, which is probably, I mean, that's the go-to text on, on this on this conversation. It was a big guiding uh, text for what I was trying to do as well. And then people like RDMCs, you know, guys that are really committed to understanding the way that international law frames things and how to work within that structure right so i guess i'm on the one hand i'm like throw it all out burn it all down start from the, but then on the other hand i'm like i see the work that they do i understand the nuance and the creativity um and, and how they apply it and so yeah i'm still figuring that out a little bit you know i think they are too um but i guess i guess when you just look at all of the ways that international law has been misapplied in the context of palestine or applied in order to ensure that Palestinians remain, you know, <laughs> kept in the place, so to speak, or, or, or pacified, then it's, it's hard to see the emancipatory potential sometimes. That's all I would say, you know. Yeah. Um, certainly, you think, if you think about things like interno the International uh, Court of Justice's decision uh, with regard to the wall, you know, it, didn't, the advisory opinion, it didn't stop the building of the wall. It might have halted things for like one meter here, two meters there. It didn't remove the wall. Um, but again, I understand then um, why people sometimes think that they need to pivot and work within that frame. Can you, uh, you know, it's so funny. I had never even thought of this until mm. right now. Who is on the International Court of Criminal Court? I mean, can you like from... From where does it derive any power? What is the sort of nominating structure of this thing? What power does it have yeah. any any way to to enforce this type of thing? Because I mean, when when we think about justice, it's obviously related to the judiciary, right? But it's sure, like, yeah, yeah. What judiciary are we even talking about? Yeah, no, it's a really good point um, because that in and of itself sometimes dictates which cases are being advanced. Um, now, the previous, so the Office of the Prosecutor, the previous 
um, head honcho in that, um, Fatem Ben Souda, was quite keen on advancing um, the role that the International Criminal Court would pe- would play in the context of Palestine. He was very keen on the on the situation on the ground in Palestine. So they were, you know, pushing for um, submissions to be brought forward, evidence to be gathered up and um, brought to the to the office of the prosecutor to try and open up a potential case uh, of war crimes being committed in the, in the space. Um, but of course, then the office, the, the chief prosecutor changes, right? They, they change over time. They get elected, they get nominated by a group. Um, and the new, it seems to me anyway, and, and a lot of international lawyers have said this, that it seems to me that the new prosecutor, uh, Khan, is less interested in the case of Palestine. And therefore, a lot of the energy that Ben Suda would have you know, been focusing on a lot of the civic society stuff that was going on the ground in Palestine to, to provide evidence. A lot of that energy sort of, it's still there, but it sort of dissipates a little bit whenever you have a new prosecutor who prop maybe doesn't have the same emphasis or the same focus. Um, and that can be frustrating in itself, you know, and I mean, even if you look at the, even if you look at the, what do you call it, the, um, the recent, um, what's going on at the moment, you know, it took a long time for the ICC to come out and say anything, you know, to even make a statement on the situation. So yeah, I guess it's it's a political being, it's a political body, right? It's um it's subject to interference in in many ways, um, and that that can that can hold it back in terms of its efficacy and its ability to to you know deliver justice. Let's say who does who um defines what is legal or illegal within international human law, uh, human rights, I mean, I international mean, we, law. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we have supposedly got, you know, things like the Geneva Conventions that determine what you can and can't do. For example, the laws of armed conflict have been, you know, things that have developed over time and, you know, the things that people would be most familiar with, like you're not meant to be able to target civilian infrastructure, civilians are meant to be protected at all times. Um, and it has a v- loads of other uh, strands to that, and that's just that's law that has developed over over time, you know, um, through case law, but also um, statutes and things like that. So, yeah, that's that's where it comes from. Yeah. Okay, I, I want to go down this this thread just a little bit because I think I think there. I mean, I I've just like happened upon this like bucket of questions I have <laughs> because I realize like I don't I don't know how this works so. Right now, what is happening right now, um, the military actions that Israel is taking place right now, uh, that Israel is doing right now, they are being accused left, right, and center of breaking international law, Mm -hmm. right? Targeting civilians, you just said right now. You just mentioned that. Yep. When that case gets made, how do you actually, how do you actually take that up yeah. How can we, how can anyone try to seek justice for those uh, alleged crimes? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's about building the case, isn't it? And, and this is where, this is where, um, people gather fa- This is where people on the ground do such sterling work, like human rights organizations document, you know, alleged war crimes and, and sort of gather as much evidence as possible. And then you, this is where you want I guess the International Criminal Court to say we're opening up an investigation into alleged war crimes that are happening. And then when that happens, they will make a call for people to submit evidence. And that's where, you know, the human rights NGO sector on the ground in Palestine um, will submit their evidence to say, well, actually, this wasn't a let's let's take an example. This wasn't a um, a Hamas uh, operational unit or a structure that was used to home missiles or whatever, this was actually a hospital. And here's all the evidence that points to that. And so they will provide that evidence. This is in, a, in an ideal world, by the way. They will provide yeah. that evidence. And then you, you, would, you would ask that the office of the prosecutor opens it up, has a look at it. Now, of course, then you have, on the other side, you will have Israeli lawyers making cases um, to say, well, this was uh, you know, a legitimate target or this was a proportional response or whatever. I mean, and that's the way that this thing kind of plays out. Just, you know, it's like a, 
you know, an overinflated normal courtroom reality, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess that, I mean, I mean, probably at the limits of my full appreciation of, of this international law context, but I would say just, an, just one thing I would say, this is why the human rights organizations on the ground who do this work are such heroes, you know, they're real grassroots heroes in all of this, you know, um, organizations like Al Haq in Ramallah have just have been doing this for ages um, and, and documenting stuff. Um, and, you know, even I'm looking at people, you know, the, 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 the home of Raja Shirani was hit in Gaza and he's a leading, he's the head of a big Palestinian human rights organization as well. So, you know, I wonder why, why his, uh, why his property was being attacked. Cause they see that as, yeah. uh, you know, as, um, maybe a way of stopping this type of documentation, let's say. What happens if, if they're convicted? That's a big if. I mean, the, the success of like, the let's say if, yeah. let's say it actually is that it works perfectly. The system works exactly as it's designed, which you've established, I think convincingly that it, it doesn't work that way, but let's say it did. What, what yeah. happens actually um, functionally I, what happens? I mean, I, I mean, let's look at some of the facts and figures as well in terms of like the success rate of the International Criminal Court in terms of securing convictions is pretty low, right? There haven't been that many successful cases brought. Um, so, I mean, if, if, for if for example, you know, one of the top generals or maybe the, the head of the government, the Israeli government was brought before the International Criminal Court, tried for war crimes and then convicted, the idea is that they would spend time in, in jail <laughs> Like, you know, that's in and far away, probably over in the Hague or something like that. Um, that that's in the, in an ideal world, how, how it would, um, how it would operate, but I can't see that happening, you know? And even though, yeah. you, even though you hear like, even at the start of all that's happened, you know, I think it was maybe a week ago, I mean, time is a blur at the moment, but I think like a week or 10 days ago, I mean, I think it was the Spanish foreign minister or somebody in the Spanish government anyway, called on. Benjamin Netanyahu to be um, tried for war crimes. So the language, yeah. the language is at least as you, you know, as you pointed out, the language is out there. It's it's kind of closing the the language theoretical rhetorical gap with the practical. Um, that I think is a little bit, you know, it's a little bit difficult at times. Yeah, you know, like there's there's a chapter in your book about truth and memory, um, and language plays a big part of that, right? Mm. So. Um, things becoming part of the modern day lexicon allows us to speak truth, speak truth to power, and also mm. keep things in our uh, collective memory. Um, you you use this term memoricide. Um, mm. Can you can you explain what that term means? Yeah, and it's been used by loads of people before, so I'm yeah. I'm borrowing it. I think that's <laughs> important to know and like we all do um yeah it's about how, i mean a lot of a lot of the a lot of the um a lot of what went on at the time of the formation of the state of israel in, the, in 1948 was also about building on top of palestinian villages building on po on top of palestinian land trying to expel the, the the palestinian population so we we know that happened but what we also see is that a lot of the truth of what went on at the time has been quashed and has been attempted to be squashed i mean i guess the most visible example or one of the most high profile examples is the um is the massacre at tantura um you know um so there's an israeli uh historian ilan pape makes reference to what went on at tantura um, and basically there's a whole, there's a mass grave in Tantura that's just been built over and there's now a parking lot up there, you know? And so, so a lot of what's happening is trying to make sure that the truth around the foundation of the state of Israel is basically erased and removed from our present day consciousness, because that would shake the foundations of a lot of the myth mythology that underpins, um, you know, the the rationale for the state being there in the first place. And so my, my argument in the book is that truth recovery then as a transitional justice practice needs to really intentionally spotlight these issues. It can't, it can't, it can't allow for the platforming of, of what I refer to as settler guilt, 
as opposed to you know uh, ensuring that Palestinian um, experiences are are brought to the fore, and and that's kind of that's kind of it in a nutshell. Yeah, how you know I, I wonder how that actually how that can actually be combated, or you know maybe that's mm. not the right that's not right the the right framing like who has done this well yeah no no that's you're thing right. it's like yeah. who like i want i'm i'm desperate i'm hungry for some success stories i'm hungry for some like i don't know if it's hope or optimism but i'm i'm desperate for something to be like this can work <laughs> yeah no i I, f I feel it man i totally get you and but that is not just why it's a work a day exercise. I mean, the amount of energy that is invested on the ground to uncovering and sort of like, sort of trying to highlight all of the lies and all of the nonsense and to say, look, this is actually what happened. I mean, there is an organization in Tel Aviv called Zuhrot, um, who I think have done a reasonably good job in terms of, you know, trying to highlight all of the spaces where destroyed Palestinian villages are located and to highlight, you know, to really ensure that the, the idea that the land was empty at the time, it just, you know, is completely dispelled as, as mythology. Yeah. So I think, I think we need to give credit where credit's due. Um, I, and I think they've done a really good job, a decent job in that, you know, um, and again, obviously, I, I say I say in the book as well that they're not without criticism, because there are there are some people that believe that that type of work should be, you know, should be driven by Palestinians and not led by by settlers. If, if, effectively, that's the criticism anyway. Um, but you were looking for a positive. I think they've done a decent job. I mean, it, it's just trying to find the positivity in, at this moment in time. I guess is is a little bit is a little bit challenging. Okay, so here's a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, to somebody who's listening to this and they're like, oh, I'm interested in that. I'm interested in understanding the, the, the stories and the memories um, that have been tried to, that, have, that there have been deliberate attempts to, to try to erase. I'm interested in engaging with that and, and fighting that erasure. Mm -hmm. um, where should those people go? Are there websites or books or organizations that you can point to say, yeah, yeah, yeah go check. These people are fighting that erasure. Oh yeah, I mean, there's loads of organizations. There's an organization in in Bethlehem called Badil. I'm sure people have heard, or if anybody's interested, or maybe they I think heard. a lot of. I think you should assume that people have not heard of any of this. Fair enough. I just assume everybody knows, but um, yeah. So Badil um are based in Bethlehem and have done a load of work on this um and have documented a lot of the destroyed villages uh, and sort of given giving people access to this this material uh, on their website and things so that would be you know one of the first places that I would um I would tell people to go to and then you have like localized um groups that are doing things so um grassroots Jerusalem or grassroots Al Quds did some really amazing work on highlighting all the different Palestinian villages that were destroyed in and around Jerusalem and and all the sort of heritage and cultural stuff that's being erased in and around Al Quds and you know that they would be the two sort of go-to places that I would recommend people to do um, and then there's some sort of pop-up websites that I just can't remember off the top of my head but um, yeah, yeah go to good go deal have a look at their website so does the pursuit of justice and maybe this is like a this is a very big question but just question yeah yeah does the pursuit of justice look different in um in Gaza versus the West Bank versus 48 Palestine um does if you if you are being you are advising people mm -hmm. who are like okay well, we need to figure out a a way to transition mm -hmm. and pursue justice right mm -hmm. and like figure out um how to achieve justice in order to achieve peace right mm -hmm. that's a big question you i mean and I'm all, I'm really I, I try to stand back from things like that because I think my role as a as a as somebody who's been working in and on Palestine since 2009, I've tried to make sure that my role isn't at the front of these type of conversations. It's always at the back, and, and I've learned so much from people 
you know, comrades that have told me that we need to learn, <laughs> we need to learn to sit back a bit because one of the one of the worst things is that you know Palestine's been talked about and talked for for decades, right? <laughs> it's it's a everybody's yeah. talking on behalf of Palestinians when maybe we should learn to just shut up. That's why it took me so long to write this book. By the way, it took me you know several years to, before I felt comfortable enough just to put it into the you know into the space, but. I mean, if I was to tentatively say anything, I would say we need to look at this justice issue as a collective. I mean, the fragmentation is one of the biggest uh, tools that they have in terms of dividing and fragmenting it and sort of saying, look, you know, the, the Palestinian issue in Gaza is different to the Palestinian issue in the West Bank, is different to the Palestinian issue inside 48 and the Bedouin and whatever and the diaspora. And I actually think personally, um, and I think this is shared by you know, a fair amount of Palestinian friends and whatever, that we need to see that as a collective, right? So justice is for all Palestinians everywhere. Now, of course, there are discrepancies in terms of the the, the war crimes and the violence that's taking place, right? Especially now, we understand that all eyes on what's happening in Gaza. But we need to see that as part of a broader settler colonial logic, which is happening all around you know uh, so and then within the justice conversation you know it's it's very important that we don't lose sight i think of platforming conversation around return platforming conversation genuine conversations around land resources um having genuine and this is one i think that i think that is not often talked about really but needs to be given greater consideration is what will repair look like? How do you how do you repair for the harm? Not just what's happening on the ground in the moment, but I mean for 75 years of harm. How, how do you platform conversations about reparations? You know, so these are all things that form the justice conversation, I think. But I I, I would urge people to view it as a collective and not fragment it personally. That that would be the only sort of if if I you know give any advice, that would be what I what I would sort of say, and I think that would be fairly well received. I love I love that answer so much, Brendan. I can't I can't tell you. Yeah, I can't tell you how much. Um, I'm quite happy if, with that one too, Mikey. To be honest. Yeah, I mean it's 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 really like um, underscores. Uh, the care that you, you like bring to this. Mm. Um, on that note, mm. let's uh, take a moment to front some of these voices that you're talking about. So you mentioned um, Nura Ereket's yeah. book. I, yeah. I want to just like put together, just like let's let's put you on the spot for mm. uh, maybe five, six, seven uh, books that you're like, you know what, you care about this stuff. Yeah. Go get these books. And totally. you can, I want you to include Nuda's book again. And Yeah, I mean, Nuda's book is sensational, right? Justice for Some, probably the, one of the most important books I've read on the, on the ground in Palestine in a long time. So kudos to her for that. Um, I, th there's one writer at the moment whose work on Palestine, I think, is, is better than anything. I mean, Stephen Salida continues to be the person who pushes everything forward, right, in every conversation. I mean, he has a litany of books. Are you joking me? This guy's unbelievable. Um, and he's a, so much experience to tell us and, and to show us. And he just continuously produces. So anything that Stephen Salida has written, um, just go and get it. Just go and get it. Um, I mean, I really love Nadim Khoury's work. I think Nadim has done some amazing stuff uh, on the ground. He, he did some work on transitional justice, actually, that was very important for me in terms of framing. And, you know, I think people should be aware of his stuff. Um, outside of the Palestine context a little bit, um, there's a guy writing in, you know, at the edges of international law from a third world approaches to international law context called um, Mohsen al -Attar. He's a buddy of mine who just, his work is just sensational. Um, 
a lot of his, he he's a he's an editor with the international law blog Opinio Juris, so people should look up his work. Um, so there's a few that people should, I think. And then you've got all the classics, right? You've got all the classics. You've got Rashi Khalidi, who's just continuously pushing us to understand the history more. He's doing a really amazing piece of work at the moment on transnational solidarity. Well, like comparing Palestine and Ireland and colonialism, which I think is going to be um, really important work. Uh, so yeah, they're just a few. Amazing. Mm. That's excellent. I'm going to ask you to put together another list. Okay, ready? All right, I'll do um, it. Yeah, since we're thinking about trans transnational um, movements mm. um, and, you know, struggle for justice and emancipation and mm. um, in different contexts, can I ask you to put together a list of different struggles around the world that people can go look up. I mean, I know I, I can be um, accused of being too in my, focused in my bubble and not realizing that there have been similar struggles in different times in different places and I can learn from them and um, understand uh, lessons of them. So we brought up Ireland, um, but if you can put together a list of those types of things too, just also just as a reading list, like, hey, go find, fall down this Wikipedia rabbit hole. Yeah. 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 God, you put me on the spot again. I mean, there's a guy in North America, Nick Estes, um, who is just, again, really brilliant at understanding and setting the scene around settler colonialism um, and, and his work on, on the Native American um, communities and, and what he does. And he connects a lot of struggles all the time. Um, and his work's just incredible as well. So I, I would certainly, I would certainly look at that as a, a jumping off point, uh, his work. I mean, I spent some time in the Basque country in, uh, in the summer, not au fait with a lot of Basque authors, unfortunately, but I think there's a lot of similarities in terms of attempted erasure, cultural heritage, attacks on language, attacks on identity, symbolism, the prisoner movement that I think people in Palestine should should look up and and have a, you know, have a have a good look at um, some of that work. That's or, and, and there's no no doubt there's work being done there. And I do think in the Irish context as well, we we do have plenty plenty to share uh, in terms of in terms of what we're doing. There's a really a really brilliant book, and I can give you a title because I know you want <laughs> these titles. Um, it's called Ireland, the Unfinished Revolution, and it's by Bill Ralston and Robbie McVeigh. And I think it's a it's a really great piece of work because it it kind of it, it it invites people to look at the situation in Ireland not as a as a finished moment in time, not as a post colonial space, but as a space that is still in need of further consideration around fully uh, extricating itself from its colonial conditioning. And I think that that's an important text for people in Palestine to, to look at or people in other, in other contexts. So I think I give you a few there. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to rest. Yeah, in yeah. The there. yeah. That's great. Um, you know, there's a lot of like, um, there's a lot of people using the term apartheid to, to mm. explain what's happening in, in Palestine. Yeah. Um, and it's a term I'm very comfortable using. I think it is apt. Um, some people have a hard time using it. Um, but obviously that, that term comes from South Africa. Um, and I, I would love to know, do you know much about the sort of peace and reconciliation process in South Africa? Have you studied it much? Yeah, a, li a little bit, a little bit. And actually the, um, there's a there's a brilliant piece of writing called How Transitional Justice Colonized the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It's by a guy called Roberts. He was very involved in uh, in the truth recovery um, processes uh, there because you know that was their big thing in South Africa. Uh, once the fall of apartheid, there was like we need to engage in a truth and reconciliation process and a healing process. That's you know um, otherwise we're not going to be able to <laughs> we're not going to be able to move on. So a little, a little bit, yeah, a little bit. I wonder like if that's something, if that mm. is like a playbook 
that, you know, that could be applied. Yeah, I think I think it's really interesting you brought the apartheid thing up actually because I I understand why people are reluctant to use it solely, right? So if you if you just frame everything within the apartheid language and the apartheid framework, I think that limits it sets it sets sort of boundaries as to what's happening. Um, and I I don't want to say one is worse than the other, right? I'm, I I don't I don't feel comfortable saying South Africa apartheid was less of you know an issue than Palestinian apartheid. I mean apartheid is apartheid in that sense, but I think it's I think and I think it's a useful language, right? And let's you know language is critical in this in this moment. It's a useful language because it's a language that has been used before in international spaces to 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 sort of bring about the end of the white supremacist rule in South Africa. So people were able to see a, you know, to see an end to the apartheid regime. They were able to refer to it as such. They were able to to identify and and by way of example in Ireland for example, we, you know, the apartheid issue was something that galvanized people in Ireland significantly. Um, you know, Ireland was one of the strongest voices of the anti-apartheid movement. Um, we had boycott at a time in the 80s. You know, we were leading the charge in that in that sense. And there was a brilliant piece of writing by a an international lawyer from uh, Dublin, a guy called John Reynolds, who's done a lot of work on international law. And he wrote about the importance of bringing the apartheid language into the public sphere again, because that might be one angle that we can use to to pivot towards putting the situation of Palestine right back on the international agenda. But I think it's critical, and John says this as well in his piece, it's critical that we don't solely use it. It's just one component of various other tools that we need to use. Um, yeah. So I think it's important, you know, I think it's important. I wouldn't dismiss it outright, personally. Yeah, I, I, that's an interesting, interesting perspective. I'd never thought about it. That if anything, it just like is an oversimplification of it. Mm, um, are you working on any other uh, anything else right now that um, might be relevant? Yeah, I mean, I, I, one of, one of the areas that I've been working on now for the last couple of years is forced displacement. Um, it's a theme. So in, in our in our conflict in the north of Ireland. We had a lot of people who were forcibly moved from their homes um, at the outset of our of our conflict, um, sort of late sixties, early seventies. So, I've been involved in you know a few projects that seeks to capture some of the stories because these are stories that they're not they're not often talked about, right? So they're not they're not in the public domain as much as some of the other victim and survivor issues. Even though we have something like fifty-five thousand people who would have been impacted in a, you know, and our society is quite small. It's like one point four million. So sixty thousand, fifty-five thousand, sixty thousand is a lot. So my father was forcibly displaced. So for the last number of years, I've been gathering, you know, understandings of of his experiences and and other people. So we released a book on that recently. But also, I've been looking to, you know, how how can I engage art? as a way, as a medium to communicate these stories, um, which has been a, a lot of, a lot of fun. I have to say, I really enjoyed that type of, uh, that type of activist academic intervention, if you get me. And I'm working with, a, a, a an artist and filmmaker in New York called Casey and him mm. and I have done some work and, you know, that's the next step for me is to maybe talk about that work a little bit more, um, at the same time, you know? Yeah. Um, before we wrap up, yeah. I just want to ask you um, a last question about about the sentiment in Europe. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, you've uh, presumably lived most of your life, if not all of your life, um, in Europe. Have you felt any discernible change? Um, when it comes to sentiments towards solidarity with Palestine? This is a moment. This feels like a moment. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think just even in the Belfast, even in the Irish context, first of all, right? 
I think we have people talking about Palestine in a way that we I haven't heard since you know being involved in 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 the space right we we have people who maybe would be less inclined to stick their neck out let's say or less inclined to speak because even people people have their reasons for being quiet and whatever and that's fine that's their reasons but I do find that increasingly certainly in the last week and as things have just gotten even more catastrophic there are, there is a sense that people are prepared to say some things and stand up you know the rallies have been really big the people have been you know uh, been on the streets but equally i mean i i've also been pretty dismayed by the response of of european governments to to this to this moment as well i mean the suppression of pal- pro palestinian rallies across Europe has been pretty, pretty grim to see, to be honest. Um, and there's a, certainly a polarization happening, uh, in certain, in certain spaces as well. Um, so I, I, yeah, I would like to say, I, yeah, nobody was happy, you know, within a lot of people that I spoke to, nobody was happy with the way Ursula, Ursula von der Leyen came and, and did what she did. Even the president of Ireland came out and said, whoa, you can't do that. That's unacceptable behavior. So yeah. You know, um, so I guess on the uh, for, so sort of like at a grassroots level, I, I feel people are more connected and engaged and 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 sort of standing up a bit more, and that's the hope, right? That's what that's what we need. We need people to be speaking and shouting and and doing whatever. Um, but I just don't have a lot of faith in our leaders. I have to say, you know, um, yeah. so I I don't know. So it, it remains to be seen, I guess. Um, but certainly, it certainly feels that more people are talking about Palestine. That's what I would say. Okay, um, Brendan, thank you uh, so much for doing your work and taking the time. Um, it's a privilege to be able to speak to you about this stuff. I hope it was. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Hope it was useful. Yeah, no, no, it really was. Thanks so much. Great, man. Thanks.